Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of History of Science and Technology Q&A. Uh, sorry, we're starting a little late. A few bizarre technical problems here. Um, all right, we had a whole bunch of questions saved up from last time. Um, there's a question from Slayer here. What did doctors learn from Henrietta Lacks's cells? Okay, I can try and talk a little bit about that. I don't know fully the history of this. First point is there's a, when biological organisms grow, one of the key things that happens is cells divide. And there's a question, if you have a, an organism and it's growing, how long does it grow for? Do the cells just keep on dividing forever? Or is there, is there a limit reached where the cells stop dividing, where they kind of know the organism is sort of fully grown or something, and where you just stop dividing cells? And there's some organisms, some more primitive organisms, where they just keep dividing and they just keep going and they keep growing out. And, you know, back in the, I don't know, Precambrian period, there are big mats of, of uh, organic material that probably were formed um, that just kept growing forever. As we get more sophisticated and as we make uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, higher animals and so on, it's like we grow for a certain point at a certain time and then we stop growing and then maybe we have children and then they grow and so on, but, but there's a limit to growth. Now, if you just imagine the kind of whole uh, tree of cells in a biological organism in the sense that you're starting off from the, the single, you know, uh, like fertilized egg cell and then it divides in two and then that, that divides to four and eight and so on, after a while, it becomes more complicated and it's no longer every cell just dividing in two. It, there, there are some cells that are more like stem cell like things where it's like a cell keeps on budding off new, uh, new other cells. There are others, actually that's not the meaning of stem cells, it's more something where you can get uh, you can, you know, pluripotent stem cells where you, can, where you can get to all other cell types. As, as, you, as you look at this kind of sequence of dividing cells, eventually you'll get a cell that's a bone cell or eventually you'll get a cell that's a immune system cell or something. And then there is a, the, the, at some point you'll get sort of all the cells in the final organism, but there's this kind of whole hierarchy of what cells can divide from what other cells. Okay, so one of the questions is, how do cells sort of know to stop dividing? And there are typically chemical signals that tell cells okay, there's enough of you, stop, stop dividing now. Um, and uh, there's, but there's a, another phenomenon that probably has quite a lot to do with aging, for example, that if you have a particular cell and it keeps dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing and so on, that there's a limit on how many divisions you can have. And that limit, it's usually called the Hayflick limit, is on the order of 50 divisions. And the... Uh, so once you have an initial cell, the maximum depth of the tree is essentially 50 nodes. That's the maximum. So the maximum size of the organism will be like two to the 50th cells or something. Um, that uh, uh, would be that would be determined by this um, uh, this this maximum number of divisions that you can have. There's some suggestion that that maximum number of divisions has to do with the telomeres at the the ends of DNA that are these repeating sequences and that you kind of start with on the order of 50 of those. And they seem to kind of get dropped off every time cells divide. Obviously they have to get refilled again um, when the next generation of organism uh, comes around. And there's, um, and there's also, uh, I don't remember all the details of it, but there's a enzyme telomerase that is responsible, I think, for, for adding on telomeres. And I think it, it's kind of like I, because I always do all these crazy things, you know, I went and sent off my, my DNA to some place that will measure telomeres. Usual DNA sequencing doesn't do so well with those repeating pieces because the way that DNA is reconstructed involves sort of solving puzzles which require that you have different, uh, different um, elements in the sequence to be able to see how the puzzle goes together. And when there's something that repeats, there are too many different ways that the puzzle could be assembled and you can't really tell how it works. But anyway, there are ways to measure telomere length and so you can kind of say, well, how old am I? You know, as I gradually age and divide, my cells divide and so on, am I using up all my telomeres? 
And at which point at the end, after all the telomeres are used up, the, you know, the DNA might just sort of unspool itself because it doesn't have the right end caps on it. And it's said, but of course, the, the you just lose telomeres as you age as cells divide isn't quite the whole story because you know, it's like, well, if you eat better and exercise better and so on, well, you can end up with more telomeres. And it's not clear what exactly the telomere length is an indication of, but perhaps it has something to do with this Hayflick limit of maximum cell division. Um, the, uh, so, okay, so that's, that's the typical behavior of cells as they divide for a while, they either get signals from other cells saying, we don't need any more cells in this area, stop dividing, or they hit this Hayflick limit and, and stop dividing. That's how normal cells work. Uh, tumor cells do not work that way. That's in a sense, almost the definition of a sort of malignant tumor is that it doesn't accept those signals from other cells. It doesn't accept this limit of don't divide anymore after this, after this point. And so in a sense, you know, tumors are a sort of more primitive form of life than the one that uh, we normally enjoy, so to speak. Well, so, if you are trying to do experiments on human cells and you say, well, I've got the cell and I, I want to make a cell line. That is, I want to make lots of copies of the same cell so I can do sort of reproducible experiments because I've got lots of the same cell. The, um, uh, it was, um, uh, th that's hard to do with an ordinary cell, an ordinary human cell, because if you say you put it in a cell culture and you say, okay, cell, just go ahead and divide, 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 divide. After a while, it will hit this limit and it won't divide anymore. And so that cell line will, you, you won't be able to go on using that. However, if you use a tumor cell, then you can keep, you can just keep it dividing and dividing and keep going and keep going. And you can get lots and lots and lots of copies of the same cell. So back sometime in the 1950s, there was a woman named Henrietta Lacks who um, had some type of cancer, I can't remember which kind. Um, and, uh, uh, as part of treating her, the, the, um, a, a sample of this, of this tumor was biopsied and that those cells were grown in cell culture. And those became the standard kind of cells, they're called HeLa cells, H-E-L-A cells, that are used in gazillions of biological experiments. And um, uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, you know, the state of, of um, of medical ethics was was not as it is today. And uh, I'm not even sure when uh, Henrietta Lacks or her descendants even found out that those cells were the, the big thing used in medical research. I'm not sure how many decades that took. Um, it's uh, a different, uh, that, that, that whole story has changed since then. But in any case, from the point of view of biological experimentation, it's been very useful that there's a definite cell line that you can kind of just order, you know, cells from that cell line and do experiments with them. And it's sort of an attempt to have a, a, a standard uh, sort of sample cell from, from a standard human cell that you can do experiments with. It's kind of a little bit like saying, what's the standard human genome? Um, you know, it's, there's everybody's genome is different. Everybody's cells are different, but it's useful to have some standard that you can use as a basis for doing experiments. And one can certainly ask the question, well, this particular uh, cell line that came from a tumor from sometime in the 1950s and so on, from some particular person with, you know, some, and, you know, you can go look at that, that cell and you can go find the DNA of this particular individual. And, and you know, you can find the, um, uh, the, you know, no doubt you can go find the two X chromosomes and all those kinds of things. And that'll be different from a, from a cell with X, X and Y chromosomes and so on. But in, in medical experimentation, there's great value to having repeatability of, yes, we've got the same kind of cell, uh, even though that cell may not be typical of all cells. And it may be that there are things that you can do that are sort of potential um, kinds of uh, tests of, of medical things that uh, uh, if you could do them on a wider diversity of cells, it would be better. But the, um, that particular, there's, there's value in being able to compare different things and so having a sort of standard cell line. And that, so that's the, that's the story as, as, uh, as far as I know of, of, of the HeLa cell line. Let's see. Uh, okay, there's a few questions here which I can partly answer. There's one from Parmenides asking about the Higgs boson controversy. 
oh boy, I haven't seen this controversy. It says many physicists are saying they fudged the numbers to get more funding. Oh boy. Yeah, well, experiments are hard. You know, these big experiments are really hard. I have to say that the question of, okay, the best case when you do experiments is the effect you see is so dramatic, so obvious. You're not grunging around trying to do statistics and, you know, trying to tease out this, you know, two sigma effect over this and that and the other. I mean, I have to say that often in these big experiments where you're teasing out a small effect, you can ask, you, you, a very common thing is, uh, particularly in something like a particle physics experiment, it's like you get some number of particle events and you say, uh, from that, I need to deduce what fraction of the time did this happen? Well, that may be very hard to figure out because is each particle event is its own separate snowflake, so to speak, its own separate thing where the particles went in this direction, that direction, and so on. You have a detector that's measuring you know, where the particles went. It might be something where there's some, uh, you know, a particle goes through in this direction, some tube fires and uh, or some semiconductor detector uh, records a voltage in that particular direction. So you know a particle went in that direction. And so then the question is, uh, you've, got, you, you've got the actual events that occurred, however many there are, millions of them maybe, maybe more. Um, and you've, then you've got what the theory says should happen. And the theory again says, oh, well, there's certain probability for different events and so on. Now you have to do some kind of inversion. So you have to say, given the theory, what would we expect in the experiment? Then given what we observed in the experiment, what does that back imply about the theory? That's a hard thing to figure out. And it's fraught with mistakes. And I know when, when I was working in particle physics in the late 1970s, uh, that was a time when people were really first starting to do these very complicated kind of Monte Carlo, Bayesian inference type things on figuring out, given what you observed in the experiment, what does that back imply for what the theory must have been? And certainly when I was involved in this, particularly in the, in the discovery of the gluon, which I was rather deeply involved in, um, and I, I put it in kind of sounds like quotes, because it was a messy story, very messy story, where the full structure of quantum chromodynamics, of theory of quarks and gluons applied many things. You could check a lot of those things. But if it's like, I want a smoking gun, I want to see a gluon, gluons like quarks are permanently confined inside particles. So you don't get to see, you know, pick up a, uh, you know, I've got a bottle of, of free gluons or something. It's a more inference, inferential kind of thing. And so it's, it's difficult to, to do that. And certainly it wasn't the case that you could find the very obvious, I've just discovered a gluon, it's here, look at it, I can see its track in the eye experiment type thing. It was a more complicated inference. And you know, when I was involved in it, it was, oh, it, was, it was in many ways done shockingly wrong. And yes, it was a case, in that case, for example, there were particular you know, ex people, accelerator labs and so on, which wanted to be the place that would be sort of recorded in history as the discovery place of the gluon. And uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, complicated organizational jockeying and uh, the science I, I kind of felt almost becomes a secondary type thing in that type of situation. So I don't know, I don't know the story of, of um, the uh, uh, whatever's happened right now with the Higgs boson, but I just say these experiments are hard. And it's, uh, and the question of when do you say, here's another, another issue, another issue, which uh, is you're doing an experiment, you do all these different kinds of data analysis, eventually you find a signal, okay? Do you stop at that point? Or do you keep going? And you say, well, if I'd done my data analysis yet another way, would I have found a signal or not? And you know, you had four different ways to do your data analysis. One of them found a signal, but maybe that signal is sort of a, well, if you'd done it one of the other ways, you wouldn't have found a signal. And maybe it was sort of a fake because you went on until you found a method of data analysis that gave you a signal. Is it a fake? Is it not a fake? It's complicated. And I would say that this is one of my fears actually, as we look towards experimental uh, implications of our theory of physics is that it becomes kind of complicated to know, you know, when do you do an experiment? The experiment is very hard. You know, what are the sort of, uh, what are the expectations um, of how, you know, 
if, if you want to do the experiment and show that the effect does not occur, you just do it and you don't keep on doing those analyses until you can actually tease an effect out of the noise. You just say, oh, it's all noise, there's no effect. And you, know, you can say, well, that's bad science, but you know, it, at some point, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to know, when do you stop? You know, I think this happened, for example, with, the, with things like the cold fusion business. It was like there were experiments done, they were hard to reproduce. People said, oh, the effect can't be there. Well, the question of why were they hard to reproduce? Maybe they were hard to reproduce because the only way that you get that effect is when, the, when you're not at sea level, because it depends on having extra cosmic rays, which we didn't know mattered, or when some other, you know, when the lab when the lab is all dark because it's destroyed by light or you know lots of different kinds of things where it's very hard to know what was the effect that actually mattered and as you try and think about doing those experiments you say well i don't see anything i don't see anything i don't see anything well did you try making it brighter did you try moving it to denver did you try doing this well at some point you just say no i i tried all the reasonable things i could try i didn't see anything therefore there is no effect is it really true there's no effect? Hard to know. So it's difficult. And, you know, I'm afraid this is, people always say, you know, experimental science is all about just, you do the experiment, you see what happens. That's how you conclude what's true in science. It does not work that way in practice. It's much more complicated. There's much more of an interplay between what you expect to see, how you do the experiment, how you interpret the experiment, all those kinds of things. Um, and while people would like to look to science for sort of the ultimate cut and dried answers, uh, it doesn't tend to work that way, which works a lot better with computer experiments. Computer experiments are much more cut and dried, just like sort of pure mathematics is in many ways more cut and dried until you get into the question of, is that proof really a proof type thing? Um, and, uh, but, but that's, it's, you know, that this is the difficulty of, of actual experiments. I mean, another sort of the fundamental sort of idea of experiments is, you can do an experiment which, in which you carve out of the world something which is an isolated thing where you can just do your experiment and it doesn't depend on anything else. And that's probably theoretically impossible. That is, like I was saying before, you know, you're doing your experiment on your palladium electrode or something for cold fusion, and you say, I'm just working on that. It doesn't matter that the air temperature is this. It doesn't matter that something from the outside world is this. I can do an isolated experiment. That may just not be possible in, in some theoretical sense. And in fact, as we look, look at our theory of physics, we can see that there are things where, in fact, just yesterday, I ran into something trying to uh, look at some results someone else had got of realizing that it actually matters when you're studying this, this system, or you think you're studying some system about gravity uh, with black holes and all this kind of thing, it's like, what's on the outside of this, it actually matters. You can't just isolate it and say, I'm just going to look at this part of the system and nothing else. Although that is the kind of meta claim of sort of Baconian type science is you can do an isolated, independent, reproducible experiment. Um, so it's a hard thing to do. Now, in terms of, of um, uh, the Higgs boson and so on, yes, I, I did meet Peter Higgs, you are asking that. Um, maybe, well, let's see, a couple of times. I remember one time uh, in Edinburgh, actually, where he lived. Um, the, um, uh, you know, I think um, back in the day, I mean, just to give a little bit of history here, and somebody asked about Steve Weinberg, uh, who, who died uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, yes, I, I did know Steve Weinberg. Um, the... Uh, and, and that sort of, as we talk about Peter Higgs and Steve Weinberg, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more of, um, of that relationship. Um, it used to be the case that what's now called the standard model of particle physics was basically what used to be called the weinberg salam model. And uh, how did that originate? Well, let's see. The um, sort of the big thing that they're, they're sort of in, in particle physics, there are these sort of often said to be sort of four fundamental forces, the strong nuclear force that kind of holds quarks and gluons together and holds atomic nuclei together, the 
the weak nuclear force that's responsible for beta decay and that all has to do with W bosons and things like this. The electromagnetic force have, and having to do with photons and electricity and so on and gravity. And sort of the standard model is the story of what particle physics has learned about sort of strong, weak electromagnetic forces. So back in the day, this is now, um, uh, so electromagnetism, uh, the quantum theory of electromagnetism was kind of first proposed really in the 1920s and really got worked out in the 1940s. That's the theory of quantum electrodynamics. Uh, the original idea when quantum mechanics originated, um, sort of uh, things like Schrodinger's equation and things like this originated in the 1920s, the issue to deal with electromagnetism was you can, Schrodinger's equation deals with, I've got an electron, one electron, maybe two electrons. I've got one, I've got a few particles. In a field, like an electromagnetic field, you've got the idea of photons where you don't have a fixed number of photons. You're just producing photons, virtual photons to represent sort of pieces of the field and you're producing lots and lots of these and the number of photons can change. And so that needed a field theory rather than quantum mechanics, it needed quantum field theory. And actually very early in the history of quantum mechanics, people were already talking about quantum field theory. The, the, the theory of quantum mechanics where the number of particles wasn't fixed. And so an early observation was that there would be vacuum fluctuations, just as there are quantum mechanical fluctuations, uncertainty in energy, whatever else, there's also uncertainty in the number of particles. And that led to the idea of vacuum fluctuations and, and lots of other things related to that. But already quantum field theory had been, had originated with people like Heisenberg had worked on it back in the 1920s and uh, late 1920s. It was known that it was mathematically very difficult working with quantum field theory. Uh, there was these things called Fox spaces, which were invented ooh, by maybe 1930s. It's a kind of an idea of, uh, it's when you describe a, something like an electron in quantum mechanics, you have a wave function, it's a function. And it describes the um, kind of the um, uh, things about probabilities of electrons. If you want to have a field which has a variable number of particles in it, what you basically have to have is something where you have this generalization of functions where you have not just one function that describes one electron, one photon, but a sort of a, a family of an arbitrary number of functions. And that's kind of one of the mathematical things that had to be developed there. But what happened back going into the 1940s um, was uh, that, well, there were a bunch of problems when people, the theory of electromagnetism, the quantum theory of electromagnetism, it was fairly obvious what its structure should be. That was obvious by the 1930s, that was pretty obvious that there would be a description in terms of by that time, it was the Dirac equation, which had been invented in the 1930s. That's the equation for relativistic electrons and uh, Maxwell's equations were alive and well that had been invented in the, in the late 1800s by James Clerk Maxwell. Those are the equations for the classical electromagnetic field. It was easy to see what the quantum analog of those should be. So one had the quantum equations for electrons, the quantum equations for the, uh, the equations for the electromagnetic field. It was quite easy to see how those should be coupled together. It was quite straightforward to construct a theory of quantum electrodynamics, to write down what the theory should be like mathematically, to define its energy function, its Hamiltonian, its thing that describes that the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics is a thing that also is, is a sort of generator of time evolution. So it kind of tells you how, the, how a system of electrons and photons should evolve with time. So that was all pretty well understood. Big problem. The, when you tried to compute things in quantum electrodynamics, you got infinity as the answer to many kinds of things. Fundamental reason is if you have an electron, and let's say an electron is a sphere of charge. It's, the electron has a negative charge, minus one in some units. Let's say you've got the sphere of charge. It's all negative charge. All the pieces of the electron, they'll just repel each other because light charges repel. So every electron just blow up as a result of being having this sort of charge that's, that's pushing it apart. Now it might have some forces that would hold the electron together. People at one time actually thought vacuum fluctuations might hold electrons together, but that doesn't work out that way, um, at least not in the usual theory of physics. Um, and, but the, the key problem was that the self energy of the electron, the, the amount of uh, energy force associated with the electron acting on itself and uh, you know, one piece of the electron repelling another piece of the electron, the, the size of that 
energy increases like one over R, where R is the, uh, as, well, it's proportional to one over R, where R is the radius of the electron. So when the radius of the electron goes to zero, that goes to infinity. Okay, so that was a problem. The next problem was in quantum theory, there was no understanding of how to deal with particles that weren't point particles, particles that had non-trivial extent. And things like string theory, one started to have an understanding of extended objects in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, uh, more in quantum mechanics initially there. But um, uh, back in the day, one only knew how to deal with point particles. And worse than that, when one was dealing with relativity theory, dealing with extended objects in relativity is also quite complicated because it's kind of like you accelerate the thing and one piece of it, you know, the thing effectively elongates and how does that work? And it's all very difficult to make it consistent with relativity. But in any case, so you got an electron and the claim is to make it consistent with quantum mechanics, it's got to be of zero size, uh, kind of, uh, and, and yet at zero size, the thing has infinite self-energy. Oops, there's a problem here. Okay, now in quantum field theory, the way that's represented is you've got an electron, it's tooling along, it emits a virtual photon and then reabsorbs it again a very short time later. And the rate of emission of virtual photons increases as the, uh, the, the well, the, the number of possible photons you can emit as you, as you look at sort of shorter and shorter times between emission and reabsorption, there's kind of an infinite number of these photons that can get, as, as that time goes to zero, the number of these photons goes to infinity. And that again leads to the same result, basically, as the classical result about an infinite self-energy. Okay, so it didn't, quantum field theory didn't immediately solve the infinite self-energy problem. Okay, so how does that work? Well, what happened was, this was a contribution of Dick Feynman, uh, Richard Feynman, a uh, friend of mine from when he died in 1987, but I knew him for from probably the 1978 until then. Um, and uh, the um, so his big contribution was the idea of renormalization, the idea that yes, there is an infinite self-energy associated with the electron, but every electron has all this cloud of photons around it that's producing all this big self-energy. And it's like, it's okay to just say, the, the, the true bare electron has minus infinity mass. The, um, uh, but then every electron in real life has lots of a, a cloud of photons around it, which is adding sort of a plus infinity amount of self-energy. And well, by golly, the minus infinity and the plus infinity cancel out, and the real answer should be just the mass of the electron. Okay, so Dick Feynman always thought this was kind of a kludge. But the, the big thing that happened in quantum electrodynamics is it was proved that the number of such kludges that you needed to put into quantum electrodynamics was three. There were three infinities. There were three kind of bare objects you needed to define. And that was enough to kind of have, uh, have quantum electrodynamics and say, just got these three weird arbitrary things that go in there, and then you can have consistent quantum electrodynamics. That was not, um, so that was understood by the 1940s, 1950s maybe, for that to be really understood. People were able to start computing um, the uh, uh, lots of features of, of quantum field theory, lots of predictions from quantum electrodynamics. The anomalous magnetic moment of the electron was one big one that was originally computed by Julian Schringer, the so-called G minus two. Uh, another one was the Lamb shift, the hyperfine splitting in hydrogen was uh, a shift of a, a sort of relativistically, quantum field theoretically a computable shift. Um, I actually know, well, I, I know Willis Lamb was a long time user of our Mathematica system. I don't think I ever met him. Um, but uh, the, um, um, so then, there were these various predictions of quantum field theory from quantum electrodynamics, they worked just fine. Okay, meanwhile, in the other part of sort of particle physics was the weak interactions. So the characteristic phenomenon there is nuclear beta decay when, well, it even happens with a single neutron. A neutron decays after about a thousand seconds into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. And so that process, the weak force, that was figured out in, um, it, was, it was just not clear. I mean, nuclear uh, people like Enrico Fermi had worked a lot on the weak nuclear force and on beta decay, uh, you know, radioactivity, there's alpha decay, which is emitting helium nuclei. 
uh, you know, two protons, two neutrons. Uh, nuclear beta decay is a very common type of, uh, of, of radioactivity um, that occurs sort of throughout the periodic table. That was a, that was a big thing. When strange particles were discovered, uh, things like the kaon, things like um, uh, the, the lambda particle and so on, their decays were associated with a weak, weak force. Um, they can be produced in pairs using the strong force, but they had to decay through the weak force. So sort of weak interaction showed up all over the place. Actually, when I was getting interested in particle physics back around 1972, um, I was, that was my favorite topic was weak interactions. And I wrote this big thing, which you can probably find on the web when I was about 13 or so, which was this few hundred page uh, whole treatise on weak interactions. Um, so I was rather interested in those things and I could tell you lots more about the physics of that. Um, it's kind of fun for me that there were, uh, um, there were processes where I was like, well, this might happen in principle. You know, it's gonna be a long, long time before anybody measures it. For example, pi zero, the pi zero particle decays in about 10 to the minus 16 seconds, usually into two photons, but it can also decay into a neutrino antineutrino pair. And I think, I think that's now been observed. And um, that was a thing where, to me, that just seemed like far, far out in the distant future when I was first studying these things. There's another one, the um, uh, kaon going to pion and neutrino antineutrino. I think that's also been observed now. But that seemed like distant future back when I was studying these things. But those are all inter examples of the, of the weak interactions. So the question was, what produced the weak interactions? The thing that was figured out in the 1950s uh, in the one time that, that Dick Feynman and Murray Gaman, two people I knew fairly well, uh, actually collaborated was in this thing called the V minus A theory of weak interactions. And so the question was, when you had a weak interaction, what seemed to happen was with, with, with electromagnetic interactions, there was sort of plenty of action at a distance. There were virtual photons that could be exchanged. You could have two electrons that were far away from each other. They would exchange a virtual photon. They one, one of these electrons would effectively affect the other one. There would be a, a force that was transmitted over a significant distance. With the weak interactions, the distance over which things were transmitted was very small. It was like it was a point contact type interaction. There was no, there was no extension to it. And so that was kind of, so the first question was, well, what kind of an interaction? What, if you were to extend it, what kind of particle might be being exchanged to make that interaction happen? And photons are so-called vector particles. They have spin one. Um, that's kind of roughly the number of, uh, you know, if you write down their description in, in the mathematics, it means that there is a, a, a vector, like, like for example, in, in um, the electromagnetic field, there's an A mu, which is the vector potential, that's the, four, the vector four potential, um, that is a vector kind of thing. When you deal with gravity, it's a tensor field. It has, it's like G mu nu, the metric tensor, has two legs, two indices. And uh, uh, for example, when you deal with the Higgs particle, it's spin zero, it has sort of, uh, uh, it has no indices, just a, a scalar object. So there's this notion of scalar, vector, tensor, these different kinds of interactions would be mediated by different kinds of particles. Axial vector interactions are ones where there's, uh, where in an ordinary vector, when you, if you reflect the vector, you get, uh, you'll, you'll get sort of the opposite vector. An axial vector is something like a, a, a sort of a screw direction where if you reflect it, you kind of still have the same thing. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a um, it, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, operate under reflection the way things usually operate. Anyway, what, what Feynman and Gelman figured out in maybe 1950s, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess what had happened was in uh, nuclear beta decay, I think it was 1956, it was discovered that parity is violated. That means that if you take sort of a, if you have a, a picture of what happens in nuclear beta decay, and then you have, have a mirror reflected version of that picture, you could tell one of them is the real nuclear beta decay, one of them is a fake. In electromagnetism, you wouldn't be able to tell that. The, the mirror reflected version will be as valid as the non-mirror reflected version. But for weak interactions, there's this phenomenon of parity violation discovered um, in, uh, or was it cobalt 60 decay maybe? I'm not sure. But anyway, it was, it was discovered and you could describe how it was discovered. It's not so important for right now. The, 
parity violation was discovered. That then led to this V minus A theory of, um, uh, of weak interactions, which was sort of a descriptive theory of weak interactions. So how do weak interactions really happen? Well, the idea that sort of emerged was, well, maybe there's a thing, a W boson, that was kind of the analog of a photon, but instead of it being zero mass as photons are, that leads to a, a, an inverse square law of interaction, it would be have some non-zero mass. When you have a non-zero mass particle exchanged, you get this thing called the Yokawa potential named after Hideki Yokawa, who in the 1930s proposed that the way nuclei are held together is by the exchange of pions uh, between, or he didn't know they were called pions yet, but that's what they became called um, between protons. That's kind of a more primitive theory than modern QCD, um, somewhat equivalent. But, but basically that when you have a massive particle exchange, the potential is e to the minus mu r, or the whole thing divided by r. So it has an exponential as well as the inverse square-like term. So it, it dies off very rapidly. It can be, it can be a potential that's, that's substantial, it's a substantial force at very short distances, but then it dies off very quickly. So what it was conjectured was in the weak interactions, there might be a W boson that um, was, uh, was, um, was the thing being exchanged. Back in the early 1970s, it was called usually the intermediate vector boson, and it was all a bit mysterious. It wasn't clear how it worked. But that was kind of an idea. Now, what had happened was in 1967, uh, Steve Weinberg wrote a, a very short paper called A Model of Leptons. Leptons are things like electrons, neutrinos, and so on. And he had this idea that one could at least describe the, the weak uh, nuclear, the weak force in terms of a, um, oh, I have to explain one more thing. Uh, sorry. Okay, let me explain one more thing. So back in 1956, I think, uh, uh, Yang and Mills, Cian Yang, and I think Robert Mills, um, uh, Cian Yang was a pretty famous physicist who'd been involved in, uh, among other things, the suggestion that parity violation might happen along with a person called T.D. Lee. Um, and uh, Lee and Yang were, were kind of a power pair of, of physicists, um, uh, particularly in the 1950s and so on. Um, and uh, anyway, Yang and Mills had this idea of so-called Yang-Mills, what's now called Yang-Mills theory. Uh, the idea was more or less this. So we have electromagnetism where we've got electrons and they're charged particles and they exchange photons. What you can think about that, this was known um, much earlier, it was known to people like Herman Weil, um, that you could think of that as uh, what's called a gauge theory. Oh boy, let's see, how do we, how do I get through this and without having to go too deep into how that works? Essentially, okay, here's, here's a way to understand this. Um, imagine you have an electron. It has, it is producing an electric field. If you, the, the field lines of the electric field kind of go out from the electron like a hedgehog. They're, they're kind of, they're all pointing out in, in radial direction everywhere. Okay, you've got your electron. So another thing comes by, oh, it sees that there's an electric field line, there's an electrical force associated with that, I'm gonna be deflected, whatever else. Okay, now imagine you move the electron, okay? So eventually the electron will be a hedgehog in a new place and it'll have new field lines coming out. So the question is, as you move this electron, what uh, there's, there's, you have to think what happens to those field lines that are coming out from the electron. If you're, if you're far away from the electron, eventually those field lines have to readjust themselves. But if after a very short time, you, you wouldn't know that the electron has moved. What happens is at the speed of light, there's this kind of change in the field lines that has to happen to deal with the fact that eventually the field line is gonna be different. So you can think of that process of sort of the way the field lines have to change. There's sort of an inevitable change in, as you move electrons around, there's something that inevitably changes. And you can kind of, you can kind of understand that inevitable change by having this idea of, of having sort of the, the, the sort of inevitably, 
this, uh, this gauge field, it's called, that is associated with sort of this change of, of uh, uh, this, this no sort of notifying the world of what changed with the electron. This is a very rough description, but that's sort of why inevitably when there's things like charge, there is inevitably this kind of gauge field in the case of electromagnetism, it's associated with photons. That's kind of telling that is, is necessary to kind of tell the world what happens with these charged particles and sort of make everything uh, work out correctly in terms of what their fields do and so on. So it's sort of an inevitable feature of having charged particles that you have these sort of a gauge field that is associated with kind of uh, describing uh, the, the making consistency about changes in what happens with charged particles. Okay, the, the fancy words for all of this, they, you can define covariant derivatives, you can define um, uh, connections on these fiber bundles that represent uh, the, the, well, never mind. This is, this is the connection of all that stuff of fiber bundles and things like that became very big um, around uh, mid 1970s uh, for various reasons. That was, that was later in this story. Um, back in the, in the days of Young and Mills, the, what they realized was you could have a charge other than the ordinary charge, like electric charge, you could have a charge that wasn't just a scalar charge, where you just say the charge is plus one, it's minus one, it's 0.5, it's 2.7, just a scalar number. You could have a charge that was sort of had a direction associated with it, it was like a vector. Um, and you could have such charges and where you could have a charge where you say it's more like a, a, a charge, a color charge, and of course that comes up again in QCD, where sort of they're all different colors can be different sort of shades of what charge you have. Okay, so you can represent this idea of what kind of charge you have by saying in addition to the value of the charge, there's also a direction. And you can represent that kind of thing by in terms of group theory, by saying that in addition to the, if it's just a, a scalar, it's, you don't need any groups, but when you have, so group theory is talking about sort of the, the transformations that you can make on something. Like you might have a rotation group that says, that, that's a set of, that, disc, that has, contains all the various transformations you can make on something in three-dimensional space. That's a group called SO3, the special orthogonal group with, uh, in three dimensions. Um, it's equivalent to the group, and more or less equivalent to the group SU2, and the group SU2, the special unitary group um, that uh, uh, is, is of size two matrices, that's the sort of mathematical description. But basically it's like as if you have a vector that dis a charge that has vectors associated with it. Okay, when you do that, there is similarly a gauge theory, but the gauge theory has, um, uh, instead of having photon-like things, has things that sort of have uh, that, that have sort of vector information in them. Uh, what, and so what Yang and Mills proposed is that you could have a, a gauge theory that would involve things other than just sort of scalar charges. And in particular, so-called non-abelian gauge theory is a theory where the groups, oh boy, this is, uh, okay. So when you have a, a transformation in a group, uh, you could say, let, let's say you're, you're, um, uh, you're just rotating around a circle. You say you rotate by 20 degrees, you rotate by 30 degrees. It doesn't matter whether you do 20 degrees first, then 30 degrees, 30 degrees first, then 20 degrees. That's called an abelian. That means that the group of the circle, it's called U1, is an abelian group. Uh, if you, on the other hand, when you deal with rotations of a sphere, it matters in which order you do the rotations. You'll get a different answer if you rotate it one way rather than the other. It's kind of like a Rubik's Cube type story. It matters which, in which order you do the transformations. That's a so-called non-abelian group. SU2 is a non-abelian group. So what Yang and Mills proposed is that there might be non-abelian gauge theories. They thought of that as a possible theory for strong interactions and things to do with pions and so on. They weren't imagining other kinds of things. What Steve Weinberg did was to suggest that SU2, the sort of SU2 gauge theory might be what was relevant for weak interactions. And it's a little complicated because the uh, electromagnetism is a, is a U1 gauge theory. Um, uh, the, uh, 
uh, what Steve Weinberg suggested was that weak interactions are like an SU2 gauge theory, but it isn't quite like just the weak interactions and just the electromagnetic interactions. It's a bit messier than that. There's kind of a mixing between the effects of photons and the effects of W bosons. And so that led to a thing called the Weinberg angle. Um, let's see, sine squared theta W is about 0.35, as I remember correctly. If I remember correctly. Um, and actually, I remember computing that in some model. Uh, yeah. The, um, uh, in any case, you can, you can work out. So what, what the original 1967 paper uh, talked about was SU2 cross U1 gauge theory. Um, and that was a theory of leptons, things like electrons and neutrinos. Those things have electromagnetic forces, electromagnetic interactions and weak interactions, but do not have strong interactions. So it was a theory of how those things worked using SU2 cross U1 gauge theory. Okay, so that was that idea. And it, uh, and Abdus Salam, who I also knew, but not, as, not, not particularly well, um, was also involved, and I don't know the whole history of all the various papers that got written about that. But there were predictions from the weinberg salam model. Uh, for example, there was a prediction that there will be so-called neutral currents. In addition to the W particle, which was the mediator of, of nuclear beta decay, in nuclear beta decay, ordinarily, the charge of the particles that are decaying would change. It would be, well, they, they, they would still be conserved, but you would go from something like um, a, um, an, an electron could turn into a neutrino emitting a charged W particle, which could then turn another neutrino into an electron, for example. That was the, the most standard form of beta decay involved these so-called charge currents, where you would have uh, a charged particle that was the, the intermediate vector boson, as it was first called. But that theory predicted that there should also be neutral currents, a particle that was a partner of the W particle um, and or a partner of this intermediate vector boson, which nobody really knew existed, that would be, was later called the Z0. And it was discovered, oh boy, uh, after I was out of the business. So it was discovered sometime in the 80s. Um, although neutral currents were discovered earlier than that. Neutral currents were discovered in 1973 or four. Um, the, the particle that mediated them was discovered much later, but the, the existence of neutral currents was discovered um, in around 1974. As a matter of fact, experiments that would have discovered neutral currents were done in the early 1960s, but nobody was looking for neutral currents at that time. And so they were not, they, they weren't noticed. And actually worse than that, the bubble chamber film, that was just a method for doing particle physics experiments, had been thrown away by the time people cared about neutral currents. So they couldn't go back and look at that old data and, uh, and find neutral currents in it. But in any case, the, then, then what happened is that, so there was this theory, it had the prediction of neutral currents. It said, okay, there's this W boson, Z boson, it predicted those should exist. And then the question was, could you pull the same trick that Dick Feynman had pulled in quantum electrodynamics for these non-abelian gauge theories? Could you, could you say, yes, they have this renormalization feature too, or, or not? And the most naive way of looking at them, it didn't look promising. They didn't look like they had renormalizability. Just with W bosons and electrons and so on, you get all kinds of infinities. You don't get a finite number of infinities, you get an infinite number of infinities. Bad news. For example, the, the, well, it was known by, oh, by when I was getting into, well, let's see. Uh, yeah, it was known that, um, uh, one feature that's already a kind of a, a bit of a, uh, a weird feature is that usually particle interactions get less strong the higher the energy of the interacting particles. That's not quite true, but it's true of lots of, lots of interactions. The, for, for weak interactions, they got stronger. So a higher energy neutrino uh, is easier to stop than a lower energy neutrino. Like low energy neutrinos can go all the way through the earth, but higher energy neutrinos get stopped quite quickly. And that, that's one of the pieces that sort of contributed to the apparent inability to use this renormalization trick in weak interaction. So it was the initial thing was renormalizability isn't going to work. You're not going to be able to compute things using quantum field theory with weak interactions, with the weinberg salam model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But there was a there was a, a fix. Everything would work fine if all the particles in the weinberg salam model had zero mass. Absolutely fine. All, all renormalization worked fine. It's all good. 
The problem with that is obviously electrons don't have zero mass. Neutrinos have quite small mass. At the time it looked like they might have zero mass. Photons have zero mass, but the electrons don't. And the W particles definitely don't. So there was a problem. Well, it turned out that back in 1964 or so, uh, there had been a proposal made of what's called spontaneous symmetry breaking as the Higgs mechanism. There were a number of other people, uh, Brout, Anglet, various other people. Uh, I knew at least slightly all these people. Um, there had been this suggestion made that, okay, imagine there's another particle, a Higgs particle, and let's say that it could interact with all other particles. Um, and imagine that throughout the universe, there is a, an average, the, um, uh, there's a density of Higgs, Higgs field throughout the universe. The whole universe is full of Higgs field, but every Higgs particle can interact with other particles. So the Higgs, this Higgs field can interact with all these particles. So in a sense, an electron, every, every time the electron exists in the universe, it's going through this, this kind of density of Higgs particles, Higgs field in the universe, and it keeps on interacting with this Higgs field. It turns out that can be the equivalent of the electron having a mass. Effectively, the presence of a vacuum expectation value, as it's called, the vacuum density of Higgs field can, pr can provide effective mass to electrons and things. So the idea was that let's have something where the, um, um, where the, the, the kind of the, um, um, the, we, we, it's sort of a, it seems like a cheat at first. You say, imagine we have a Higgs field, which can have Higgs particles associated with it. Imagine we have a Higgs field and imagine that the coupling between the Higgs field and, and an electron has some value. The coupling between the Higgs field and the muon has some value. Imagine that that coupling is 206 times bigger for the muon. Well, then that will imply that the effective mass of the muon is 206 times larger than the effective mass of the electron. But it seems like a kludge because you're saying, I'm putting in this coupling and that's what's giving me the mass. Well, the mass has to come from somewhere, so maybe that's not quite such a kludge. But in any case, the Higgs mechanism was this idea of imagine there's this extra Higgs field and imagine that it develops a vacuum expectation value that throughout the universe that there isn't, uh, that, that there's this, because of the self-interaction of the Higgs particle, it is, has an instability that causes there to be a non-zero value of the Higgs field. Um, and that's kind of, that was the Higgs mechanism. And it was, you know, it was taken reasonably seriously. It was like, I hope it doesn't work this way because it kind of seems like a kludge, but it was taken reasonably seriously. Um, then actually I worked on this, um, uh, in the early universe, this whole Higgs mechanism would self-destruct because at high temperatures, this condensate, this vacuum value of the Higgs field disappears. And so with a person called Rocky Kolb, who has had a long career, mostly at the University of Chicago in cosmology, uh, back in 1979, I wrote this paper about the expansion rate of the early universe and realized that as a result of kind of the destruction of the Higgs field in the very early universe, there would be a change in the expansion rate of the early universe. But it was kind of relegated to a footnote the universe would expand exponentially and that would solve various problems. But I didn't take it very seriously because it, for all kinds of reasons, I didn't think that the universe would be able to sort of survive in the state where it could, where it was kind of unstable with respect to, to nucleation of, of sort of expansion of various different kinds. It was then taken much more seriously by people like Alan Guth, who kind of originated this uh, inflationary universe scenario, which is all about taking that idea seriously. And now, unfortunately, that, that whole model has become incredibly complicated. By the time you, you hear about you know, inflatons and lots of different kinds of particles and so on, it's definitely not going the way that successful models go, which is you, you, know, you just learn more from the model. You don't have to add more stuff to the model. Uh, the good news is kind of our modern theory of physics um, has a very different explanation of how the early universe works and starts infinite dimensional and gradually cools down to being three dimensional, but I think removes all of these issues. It preserves some of the kind of concept of inflation, but in a completely different way with respect to dimension rather than with respect to inflaton fields and things like this. But in any case, that's, that's relevant to, to this historical narrative. But anyway, so 
the Higgs field, it was, it was a thing. The Higgs particle hadn't been discovered. People didn't know if it existed. Um, but uh, then the question was, if you had, so massless, Yang-Mills theory, massless non-abelian gauge theory, renormalizable, you could calculate things. But when you had an actual mass of electrons, didn't work. What about spontaneously broken uh, non-abelian gauge theories? That is things which had the Higgs mechanism in them. Well, maybe you would preserve renormalizability. That was figured out by Gerhard at Hoft in uh, 1973 or four, um, along with Tini Veltman, his advisor, who had been very much involved in sort of making computer algebra systems for, for doing particle physics calculations. Um, uh, I wrote an obituary piece about Tini Veltman fairly recently. Um, but in any case, that was the, that was the moment where renormalizability of, of spontaneously broken gauge theories was established. And so that kind of gave spontaneously broken gauge theories and the weinberg salam theory kind of the stamp of approval of yes, you can calculate things in this theory. It, 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 it's still impossible to calculate things even without that, but there were sort of pathologies that were lurking in the corners um, that uh, uh, seemed to blow things up. So anyway, that, that's some, uh, let's see, the question had been about um, um, the Higgs mechanism and, and Peter Higgs and Steve Weinberg and so on. Um, that, was, that was by the, um, I would say by, uh, well, then the big thing that happened in 1973 was the discover of, discovery of asymptotic freedom in QCD by um, uh, three people I know, um, David Politzer, Frank Wilczek, and, and David Gross. Um, that was... Uh, uh, and Sidney Coleman had been uh, quite involved in that also, a person at Harvard along with, along with um, David Politzer um, and the other two were at Princeton. Um, that was uh, the discovery that the quantum field theory applied to the theory of quarks and gluons, which hadn't been taken very seriously up to that time because it seemed like it's all about strong interactions. You can't compute things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What was discovered at that time, and actually Gerhard at Hoft had figured out something similar probably slightly earlier, but hadn't really internalized its importance, um, the, uh, that, it was, uh, that it was a theory where uh, in the opposite, where the, kind of the higher the energy, the weaker the effective interaction. So that meant when you had particle interactions at very high energies, QCD would behave like a theory where things were weakly interacting, where you could compute a lot of stuff. And so that started a giant industry that kind of had ramped up by about 1976. I, I, I kind of worked in that industry for a few years. And because it was a very new industry, I was able to compute a bunch of things people hadn't computed before. And also I had the kind of secret weapon of using computers to do it. And so um, that, was, uh, that was a fun thing. But um, uh, that was, so QCD was sort of the, the other component that became the standard model. So I mentioned that electromagnetism is like a U1 gauge theory. SU2 gauge theory is kind of like the weak interactions. It's a little bit mixed together with electromagnetism. Uh, QCD, theory of quarks and gluons, this idea of color charge. Color charge is an SU3 charge. Um, that's, a, that's a charge associated with sort of a, a three-directional-ish kind of thing. Not quite, that's not quite the way it works. Um, but so the end result is the standard model is an SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 spontaneously broken gauge theory. And it kind of tells you the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 already tells you the basic structure of the, of the theory. Then you have to add in the Higgs mechanism. And that was kind of the, um, uh, the, the extra piece there. I think, um, um, yeah, so that's, that's the story of that. Now, now Steve Weinberg, I can, I can say more about, about quite a lot more about him. Uh, I hadn't really met him when I was back doing particle physics because I had been at Caltech and, uh, and at Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And at Caltech, one of the sort of big figures was Murray Gell-Mann, who was the inventor of quarks, among other things. And Murray uh, had various kinds of negative interactions with people. One of those people was Steve Weinberg, who refused to ever visit Caltech. So I didn't happen to meet him there. But um, the, uh, uh, I, I, he had written, he was a, he was a good expositor um, and had written a book called Gravitation and Cosmology that was a nice textbook of those things that I read back in 1976 or so when I was getting interested in the relationship between particle physics and cosmology. 
was a nice book. Um, a very, very much of a, I would say, 19th century mathematical methods book applied to more modern physics. And I have to say, I think that um, uh, when Steve Weinberg died, he'd just written a textbook about sort of undergraduate introduction to theoretical physics. And I was looking at it, it's a nice book, but it's 19th century mathematics again. It's, it's very much the kind of a, a certain style of doing physics that I would say originated probably with people like Maxwell um, in the late 1800s and kind of continued through a certain amount of, of, the, of the things. I mean, Dick Feynman was, was also into this kind of physics that was sort of mathematical physics done with essentially 19th century mathematics, you know, where special functions like the polylogarithm functions and so on are your personal friends. Actually, I'm not sure. The polylogarithm functions are always a bit exotic. Dick Feynman was into those. Nobody really knew quite what to call them. I'm not sure Steve Weinberg was a polylogarithms person so much. Uh, a lot of physicists have their own sort of favorite special functions. Um, the, uh, but, but Steve Weinberg was very much that, that style of physicist. I, I um, he was also uh, a substantial user of our um, Wolfram language Mathematica system. And uh, uh, he, he did many things, contributed a lot to physics. I remember Murray Gell-Mann uh, always used to say about him in a little bit of a put down, he would say, you know, Steve Weinberg is the person who uh, he, uh, if you want to compute something, he's the guy who knows how to compute anything. Like the particular example he gave was, you want somebody to compute the viscosity of milk, ask Steve Weinberg. So in any case, the, um, uh, when I started working on, um, well, I guess Steve Weinberg ended up writing a review of my new kind of science book that was not a particularly well-considered piece, um, and which I think I, I now understand from understanding the extent to which he was really a kind of 19th century mathematical physicist. It's like, this is alien. And I think that's kind of what, what he concluded. And I remember I had lunch with him after, after that came out, and he was like, I didn't really understand that what you were doing was sort of a new kind of science as opposed to what we have been doing before. And it's like, well, actually, the title of the book was A New Kind of Science. And although you might have ignored that title as, you know, uh, hyperbolo, hi hyperbole, you know, that was saying the main point, which is it's a new kind of science. It's not the same kind of science. It's not the same kind of way of thinking about things, the same kind of way of making conclusions, the same kind of raw material as you're used to from mathematical physics. He's like, okay, I guess I get it type thing. Um, I, I think um, I do fault him for not being enough of a student of the history of science to realize that they are kind of paradigm shifts that happen and um, to, uh, to kind of uh, imagine that he couldn't be seeing such a thing. But I, I saw him in subsequent years, um, and I, I would tell him about the, the, you know, that I intended at some point to try and do this sort of big assault on a, final, uh, a fundamental theory of physics. And he was like, oh, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. You know, we know physics is continuous and space is continuous and so on. And he said, um, uh, you know, eventually he said, please don't do that project. Why not? Well, because if you succeed, it will destroy what we've done in physics for the last 50 years. And I said, I'm really sure that's not going to happen. You know, the, what we'll find, and I, the way I would describe it today, is kind of a machine code that lives underneath the level of the kind of physics that's been done for the last 50 years. I don't think I had quite such a, 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 kind, of, a kind of colorful way to describe it back then, but that's more or less what I said. Um, and uh, so he was not, um, uh, I think I, I wrote up a... Um, um, uh, thing about the background to our physics project. And I had a section whose title was, quotes, please don't do that project. That was a quote from Steve Weinberg. So that's, um, that's that. Let's see. Let's see if I can find a few more particle physics questions here since I'm on to talking about particle physics. Uh, the question from Parmenides, did I ever meet Bryce DeWitt? Sadly, I did not. Um, the... Uh, Let's see. A question from David. What was Feynman's opinion of supersymmetry? I don't think he cared about it. I'm trying to think if I ever saw him interact with supersymmetry at all. I mean, back when I was at Caltech, uh, 
in the late um, 1970s, early 1980s, um, the, uh, uh, there, was some, there was some enthusiasm for supersymmetry. There were people, it was a person called Pierre Fayet, Glenis Farrar. These were both people working on sort of the, the consequence of supersymmetry. Also, a person called Lars Brink, who was a um, uh, person involved with string theory, which had by that time kind of merged a bit with supersymmetry. Um, and, and also, um, uh, certainly, people like Bruno Zamino, who was at Berkeley, I think, at that time, um, if I remember correctly, maybe still at CERN, I'm not sure, um, were big sort of supersymmetry people. Murray Gell-Mann was quite a supersymmetry enthusiast. And it was a basic rule of thumb that anything Murray Gell-Mann was enthusiastic about, Dick Feynman would not be enthusiastic about. I mean, they spent many years with offices basically next to each other and um, having, uh, you know, they each told me all kinds of uh, sort of terrible intellectual slurs on the other, so to speak. Um, so it was, it was one of those cases where uh, sometimes that kind of energy, that kind of uh, sort of um, interaction produces better results. I'm not sure it particularly did in this case. I remember when, when Feynman was working on sort of consequences of QCD. Uh, uh, QCD had been a theory that Murray had been quite involved in. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he was like, he was so disgusted by how messy the stuff Dick Feynman was doing was and so on. And um, uh, Dick Feynman was kind of like, oh, Murray has got all his sort of mathematical this and that's and they don't, they don't really connect to anything type thing. So I think, I think Dick Feynman would have viewed supersymmetry, I think, as kind of one of those mathematical thingy dingies that he doesn't really understand and doesn't really care about. Uh, that's what I think. I mean, there may be, may be evidence to the, to the contrary, but um, that's, that would be my impression. Um, there's a question from Parmenides about, um, does our physics project deal with gravitons uh, and how to avoid nominal as well? It's, it's a completely different story there. The, the, um, the emergence of quantum field theory is an emergent property, and the whole question of renormalizability is sort of moot when you have a discrete underlying structure to space. Um, the question of whether you can probe that structure by using features that sort of probe the, the infinities is an interesting question. And actually, I should think about that. Thank you for that meta suggestion there. Um, oh, gosh, there's a question from uh, Daver uh, about Kalabi Yao manifolds and visualizations in string theory and so on. Um, I think it's going to take me fairly far afield to talk about that and to talk about, uh, I'll be talking about uh, sort of symmetries and, and solutions to Einstein's equations and, and so on. Maybe another time I'll talk about that. Um, uh, there's a question from Parnenides about um, a millennial problem, probably created by my friend Arthur Jaffe. Um, uh, this was a, a land and clay was a, um, uh, a, a person who had a, a investment company in Boston who um, created this thing called the Clay Mathematics Institute. And its first director was Arthur Jaffe, a long time uh, mathematical physics professor at Harvard, who had this idea of sort of raising the awareness of the whole thing by inventing a small number of millennium problems, which would be kind of problems in math uh, around the year, I guess it must have been around the year 2000. It really that long ago? Well, I'm not sure. I think it was a little after 2000. Um, that um, uh, would kind of serve a little bit the analog of Hilbert's 23 problems that he proposed in 1900. At um, uh, that kind of are things where people get a lot of a lot of points for I've solved the Hilbert problem, um, and you know Hilbert's tenth problem or something. The the unsolvability of of, um, of Diophantine equations, equations involving integers, that was sort of a big deal solved in the 1960s and so on. And uh, the, um, um, it, um, uh, it was, um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? The, the um, um, this, the, so I forget how many millennium problems there are, half a dozen or so. They're all sort of, they're pretty well-known problems in, in mathematics and mathematical physics. Um, I think one of the problems in, the, 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 the problem is stated in uh, Yang Mill's theory is the problem of the mass gap of Yang-Mills theory, which is more or less the question of um, uh, 
whether quarks and gluons or things like them are permanently confined or can escape as free particles. But that's a that's can be stated as a mathematical problem about Yang Mills theory, about sort of pure Yang Mills theory, just a theory of gluons um, without quarks and things in it. Um, and that's what one of those problems is. Uh, all right, I think I'm I'm being told that uh, we ran out of time here. Um, uh, a lot of lovely questions here that um, I very much look forward to addressing um, the next time. So uh, I think we should wrap up here for now. And uh, so I'm actually about to do another live stream that's part of my day job working on uh, uh, software design. So, um, uh, but uh, for here, for this um, uh, Q&A, uh, let's wrap up.